Coming up on DTNS, do we want a phone with no ports? How about a new Xbox with no disc slot? And why 2020 may be the year of the mid-range phone. This is the Daily Tech News for December 5th, 2019 in Los Angeles for six years now. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood for about a month, I'm Sarah Lane. And in Finland, in the darkness of the forest for what feels like forever, I'm Patrick Beja. And I'm uh, Roger Chang, the show's producer under Sunny okay. Skies. Whenever you say in the darkness of the forest, I imagine moomins around you for some reason. It's pretty much what it is. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we were just talking about an IPv4 heist on Good Day Internet. If you want to know a little more about that and also a lot of breakfast cereal talk, uh, you got to get the wider conversation. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The image hosting network Imager announced Melee, a smartphone app designed to provide better experience for sharing gaming-related content. The app lets users subscribe to specific games, which then populates their feed with related memes and gameplay clips. Content will have uh, multiple layers of community and staff moderation. Obscene content will be removed, and Melee will have a strict no-bullying policy. In 2020, the app will also add more robust profiles and the ability to promote streams. Melee is available now on iOS and coming to Android in Q1 of next year. Ah, those gamers, they're everywhere. Huawei filed a lawsuit against the US FCC in the US Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, arguing the FCC's November 22nd ban on purchasing Huawei equipment with the Universal Service Fund violated its required due process protections. Huawei submitted, uh, I'm sorry, Huawei said it submitted comments that such a ban would harm individuals and businesses in remote areas and that the FCC failed to produce any evidence that it was a threat to national security. Earlier this week, security expert Brian Krebs reported that iPhones were making use of location data even if you had turned off sharing location. Apple told TechCrunch that this is caused by international regulations that require ultra-wideband, that's uh, the thing handled by the U1 chip, to be turned off in certain locations. Apple says that iOS requests location for that specific purpose, even if you have location turned off. They want to comply with those regulations. Apple says the request is handled entirely on the device, and it's not collecting that information uh, about your location. But... Apple is planning to add a toggle for universal wideband in future iOS updates. I'm sorry, ultra wideband. Uh, ultra wideband is that thing that enables precise location awareness. So Apple tags that have been rumored would use that, but there isn't anything taking advantage of that specifically in iOS right now. Alibaba-based Chinese startup AutoX has applied to test self-driving vehicles without backup drivers in California, which would be the second company after Waymo to be able to do so. AutoX would be able to test self-driving cars with a backup provided by a remote human operator rather than a driver in the vehicle if granted the permits. AutoX, good to know, good to remember. Uh, also, the co-founder of Alphabet's DeepMind, Mustafa Suleiman, announced on Twitter he will move to Alphabet-owned Google. To work with Google's head of AI, Jeff Dean, along with Chief Legal Officer Kent Walker, Google told The Verge that Suleiman will work on AI policy, hence the, the need for the Chief Legal Officer to be involved there. A blog post from DeepMind's co-founder, Demi Hassabis, timed with Suleiman's announcement, emphasizes DeepMind's commitment to long-term research. So look at this through the prism of the changes at Alphabet at the top, and then this happens a couple of days later. It looks like some pieces are already starting to move. All right, let's talk a little bit more about Ming-Chi Kuo's latest, Patrick. Indeed, analyst Ming-Chi Kuo says his sources lead him to expect that Apple will launch an iPhone without a lightning connector in the second half of 2021. If you're thinking USB-C, you are wrong. That would be a phone that is completely wireless and portless, so no ports at all. Oh, please let this be true. Please, please, <laughs> please let this be true. I was, I was, I, when I first read the story this morning, I was like, 2020, yes, I'm glad I didn't buy a phone a couple months ago. Nah, it's a little bit longer uh, than that. But However, uh, but, but it's still coming up fast. And this is the direction we've all been moving in for some time. So I, I hope it's true. But uh, yes, a wireless life, right. completely wireless. That 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 is that I don't have to give up too much other stuff to enjoy. I'm in. 
2021. Wait, what? Wait. That, that was what disappointed you, the fact that it's 2021, not correct. Right. Okay. You want it sooner. Wait, Sarah. I, I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> you want a phone? I mean, okay, seriously, it's easy to make jokes about this, and I'm sure many, many people will. But do we really think that the world, and by that I mean the infrastructure, is ready for a phone that you cannot charge with a wire, that you have to have a wireless charger when you want to charge it. Like if you don't, literally your phone is out of battery, it will die. You can't charge it. And there aren't that many wireless charger chargers in, in the wild. At home, I'm sure you might have one and it doesn't matter because you will get one with the phone anyway. But Sarah, sure. you're confident? Yeah. That you uh, no, have I'm not better? confident. Oh, okay. I, I like the idea of being completely wireless. I hate wires of all kinds. But yes, you're right. Even if I got real set up at home, it's going to take years for the airport terminals to get on board with this, uh, not to mention airplanes. And yeah, yeah, when you're out in the wild and for some reason you're you're stuck somewhere, it's almost like having an electric vehicle that only has a short range. you got to <laughs> like really plan ahead of time because no 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 you just you just carry your wireless charger with you you know you want to use it right. while it's charging you just you just hold on to the wireless charger to the back oh no you're right problem at all yeah you're right, you're right. I mean, you know everyone's got actually, pockets big enough for this stuff actually if there is like a uh, magnet system on the back of the phone and you get a small wireless charger that you have a cable for in case even smaller than what you're showing on screen, um, which is what about four inches. This is long, the high rise say. that I, that I've got right now, which is uh, not on screen, but I think it's on screen maybe by now. Uh, and, and it's, it would have a wire coming out. I've got the wire off of right. it right now, but, but yeah, you could just, you can use this. I'm a little being a little bit ridiculous saying I would use it while I'm using the phone, but I have taken this on a plane and plugged it in, to the plane's power port and used it to wirelessly charge. It, it can work. Mm. So what, what we mean is that you would go wireless with a sort of wired option uh, in case you have, you, you really need it. But in general, the hope is that also Apple adopting a technology fully would uh, precipitate the um, availability of that technology well, and, in other places. And that's why this is 2021, right? Because Apple knows that wireless charging is not there yet, but they're, but Quo is saying that Apple thinks that by 2021, we'll have enough wireless charging out there. It'll be built into more cars, coffee shops, airports, et cetera, because, it, because wireless charging is more prevalent now that they'll be able to say, you don't even need that port anymore. Mm. And we'll provide you know, some ways to deal with it for the gaps that do still exist. And like you say, it'll drive more adoption. It feels to me like it's more like USB type C, where even now, years after Apple has introduced it, it's not really there yet. We want it more and it's coming more and more, but we're still, you know, a year or two. Uh, yeah, they were until way too early universal. on that. Yeah. 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 But wireless charging is is in more places now than USB-C was when Apple added USB-C to its laptops, I think. Oh, okay. And Apple will have a very affordable wireless charger of its Dunkle. own. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> On Wednesday, users of WhatsApp in Kashmir begin to disappear from group chats. BuzzFeed News reports that the reason is that India shut down internet access in the region four months ago, and many users are now subject to an inactivity policy that removes a WhatsApp account if the user does not log in for 120 days. That policy is meant to maintain security, limit data retention. Users may lose chat logs and shared images if they haven't been backed up, however. India is WhatsApp's largest market with an estimate estimated 340 million users, and Kashmir has approximately 3 million smartphone users. So, uh, you know, small small region in terms of overall India, but a lot of users. Yeah, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of politics behind this. Uh, Kashmir is a disputed region uh, for India. They, they, they uh, are, have recently taken away its autonomy, uh, and the, as part of this move that has been controversial, uh, they took away the internet, uh, and that, that has led to this unusual practice. And without getting into you know, the where's and why's of, of the Kashmir situation in India, I think it is interesting to look at WhatsApp and say, should you make an exception? These are not people just not using it for nefarious purposes. These are people who can't use it. 
I will predict that they will make an exception. It seems like this is a very special case and it feels like, first of all, unfair for all of those users to lose their WhatsApp accounts because, you know, that's actually a very uh, uh, prevalent tool in many parts of the world. And also, um, if all of them lose their WhatsApp accounts, maybe when the internet comes back eventually at some point, it's an opportunity, to, an opportunity for another messaging app to swoop in. Mm -hmm. So there's a business incentive for WhatsApp to make an exception there as well. That's a good point. I mean, maybe WhatsApp's so dominant in India, uh, it's hard That's to say, true. but but yeah, maybe. Technology Review reports that estimates from the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, or CSET, indicate China is likely spending less on AI than has maybe been assumed. Most of the money spent on AI research in China, according to CSET, is going to fundamental algorithm development, robotics research, and smart infrastructure development. The majority of what the United States spends on AI research goes to defense purposes, specifically. Now, there's a lot of overlap between these two, but CSET referenced China's Ministry of Finance's national expenditure report with other government agencies' expenditure reports. They cross-reference them. The good news for the U.S. is that its use of AI for defense looks like it's better funded than China's. And the good news for China is that it is likely to advance fundamental AI research faster because it's spending more of its money on that. It almost seems like the two countries could help each other out. Well, and that's, you know, one of the issues that, that is brought up in this technology review article is international cooperation may be being reduced if the United States shifts too much on military because you can't that's that's confidential stuff. You don't want to share your military secrets, whereas your fundamental research, you're more likely to want to share. It seems like uh, the fundamental AI research would be, at some point, be made more public indeed. I wonder if the Chinese government would be willing to do that, especially in the current geopolitical climate. Sure. After they've already moved on to developing the next thing, I'm sure they'll be happy to let everyone else try and play catch up uh, with them and maintain their lead. <laughs> That's the way I would I would look at it. Mm. Uh, and and of course, fundamental research also benefits military research. Uh, so yeah, that's I mean, something like robotics, you think at some point the fundamental research is going to be necessary for pretty much anybody who wants to further their their AI uh, uh, um, roadmap, whether it's for the military or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let us move on to game consoles. That's always fun. Kotaku reports that according to four people briefed on the plan, Microsoft is working on a lower cost optical disc free version of its project Scarlet's next generation game console, codenamed Lockhart. Game developers speaking to Kotaku compared the performance of the Lockhart to the PlayStation 4 Pro and containing a solid-state drive, so that would uh, improve performance in the case of the new console. Microsoft reportedly wants developers to support both console versions the, with a performance target of 1440p resolution and 60 frames per, sec per second on the Lockhart, the higher um, uh, uh, range console would be 4K. So that would be the Anaconda, aka Project exactly. Scarlet. Yeah, um, that would. So, so this would be the successor to the Xbox One S, right? This is probably the successor, yes, to the Xbox One S. There have been rumors before that there would be two versions of the next uh, generation console from Microsoft. They were a little bit cagey at the introduction at E3 last year, but this is an interesting move because if you have a discless version, uh, there's already actually a an, an Xbox One S uh, called the Old Digital Edition, uh, uh, edition, edition um, which <laughs> is disc being sold. I think you're right. <laughs> well, we call it the Xbox One sad because S all digital. Um, it's a little bit sad, but honestly, it makes sense for some people. And in the context of the next generation, if you take into account the, um, the streaming services, even if that console is less powerful, uh, a PlayStation 4 Pro level of power is a little bit disappointing for the next generation. But 
even if it is less powerful, it plays the same games. And if you have access, if you have a strong uh, internet connection, you might have access to the streaming service, which means you can choose to either play the game in lower fidelity on your console that is uh, cheaper or higher fidelity with your streaming service, which could mean they position this console as the entry level. You have both options if you have a good connection and it's a way to sell a next generation console at let's say 299 when it launches which is very low price for a brand new uh, generation console could be interesting right now whether it's rational or not this feels like a better way to get people into cloud gaming to say look uh we're going to give you a decent console at a lower price but it doesn't have discs but hey you can get xbox game pass and x cloud I see more people saying, you know what? I'm in the Xbox universe. I want to buy an Xbox, but maybe I'll save some money and get this, this one without a, a disk drive and sign up for xCloud. Then I see people saying, you know what? I want to take a flyer on Google Stadia uh, and just use whatever I have because you know that your Xbox is going to be powerful enough to run games no matter what. And it's, it's a, the entry into game streaming with a fallback. If yeah, your connection right. is not working at the moment, you just launch the local version, rendering locally. Sure, it's not as good looking, but you have the fallback, where, whereas with Stadia, you don't. Um, and it is uh, um, the, the subscription aspect of it is really important as well. Of course, as you mentioned, the Xbox Game Pass is uh, incredibly popular, as it should be. It's super uh, superb value. Um, and I know a lot of people, I'll, I'll address it uh, before we get the emails. I know a lot of people are thinking, well, I need my discs because my connection is not uh, fast enough or, uh, you know, other issues like that. I understand that for some people that will be the case. Obviously, that machine won't be designed for you. Um, but even the people who buy discs nowadays are... Uh, used to putting that disk in the console and having a 15 to 50 mega, uh, gigabytes download anyway for the patches and stuff like that. So the idea that you can live in a world with local uh, uh, media only is kind of a fallacy already um, to an extent. So, yeah. Shall we talk about 5G? Sure. All right. The U.S. Federal Communications Commission announced the creation of a $9 billion fund to support deploying 5G in sparsely populated areas or rugged terrain or other hard-to-serve places. At least $1 billion of that is set aside for 5G to support precision agriculture. The fund will replace the current $4.5 billion Mobility Fund Phase 2, which was designed to expand 4G rollout and use a reverse auction format. As part of the assignment announcements, rather, the FCC acknowledge a report that Verizon, T-Mobile, and U.S. Cellular had inflated their 4G coverage maps with only about 62% of driving tests and less than half of stationary tests achieving minimum download speed shown by those coverage maps. A senior FCC official said its investigation could not determine if this exaggeration was deliberate or not and that the investigation did not show a clear violation of any specific rules. The FCC confirmed that Chairman Ajit Pai will issue an enforcement ad advisory to the broader industry. Yeah, and the carriers themselves have said, we've been saying, since you gave us the definition of how we are to report this, that this was going to result in over-reporting, uh, which they have. So, you know, give give them credit for at least sticking to their story. Same, uh, we, can't, we can't be accurate. That said, wouldn't it be great if everyone just agreed to try to be more accurate uh, and, and maybe there were some teeth in, in this more than just an enforcement advisory to be like, you know what, we'll get really mad if you do this again, uh, especially when you've got $9 billion relying on this, because that $9 billion doesn't go to any areas that are covered by, by broadband. But this shows you that 50 to 60, you know, 62%, I guess, 40 to 50% were listed as covered when they weren't properly covered. Uh, and under this new situation, they'd lose out on money to develop their rural broadband for that. That's not fair. Thankfully, they caught it. Uh, I mean, 50 to 60 percent, I have a hard time. It seems like there was a lot of eyes that remained closed that didn't want to see the the, 
the problem, uh, but we don't know that for sure. The the thing I'm I'm uh, uh, taking away from this story is, it seems five uh, G is seriously becoming the focus now, which is probably the the best thing to do, especially for those specific areas and uses. So hopefully that will help uh, the deployment. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that leads us right into our main discussion today. So don't forget, folks, uh, if you want to keep up on just the headlines each day, kind of get you through those busier days and still be smart about what's going on in technology, you got to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right, T-Mobile USA launched its nationwide 5G network in the U.S. Friday. It's available to about 200 million people. That doesn't mean all 200 million are going to subscribe to it, but 200 million people could get it if they if they use T-Mobile and have a $900 OnePlus 7T Pro 5G McLaren or a $1,300 Samsung Galaxy Note 10 Plus 5G. Uh, those aren't cheap phones, and it's probably too early to jump in for most people anyway, uh, because this is the slower version of 5G. Uh, CNET has some good reports showing it to be slightly faster than LTE, but not even all the time. Next year, things are going to change. Coverage is going to get better. Millimeter wave will come in. Phones will have the ability to take advantage of the higher speed 5G. And Michael Simon at PC World argues that all of that, combined with the announcement of Qualcomm's 765 mid-range chip. We mentioned that on the show previously. The 765 is the step down from the 865. The 865 is the flagship. The 765, however, is pretty powerful. So much so that it may be the more important announcement from Qualcomm, not the 865. Simon says... Most of the speed benefits offered by the 865 will likely be negligible based on what people use their phones to do, especially since the 765 integrates a 5G modem and the 865 does not. That means better battery life for a phone running on the 765, such as maybe the forthcoming Pixel 4a or a Samsung A50 successor. Those could become popular 5G phones that have good battery life, good performance with the 765 chip, and don't cost you as much. Simon says by the second half of next year, there could be as many mid-range 5G phones in carrier stores as high-end ones. Dieter Bone over at The Verge agrees. Uh, Dieter says, I hope 2020 is the year when people stop assuming the fastest processor with the most features is the best one. And Anantech points out that Qualcomm did this for a reason, but it may not have the effect that they wanted. The X55 5G modem has been out for months. That's the one that you have to get separately with the 865. If you wanna make a phone with 5G using the 865, you have to get the discrete X55 5G modem. The reason they did that is it fits the development cycles for handset makers. Handset makers need to get their RF systems, their antenna designs, and their certifications going all in order, and having the modem earlier allowed them to do that, and now they can add the 865 at the end of the process in a way that means they'll get these phones to market faster. So we may see the high-end 5G phones with the 865 come to market first, but by the middle to late 2020, we may yet see these 765-powered mid-range 5G phones available, like I said, as a very compelling alternative. I mean, honestly, uh, the, the the question here is the power of the CPU, which we've reached the point in phones where the, the, the power of your phone is inconsequential for your users unless you are gaming. That is, that defines, I would suspect, the There's large, even a 765G, control. though, that's not bad. Right. And... So the the difference between um, PCs and phones is that on phones you have the um, uh, uh, longevity of the battery and the power consumption, which is a factor. So having a less powerful uh, CPU is actually an advantage in many cases. And, and this, the 765, seems like the perfect, uh, you know, the perfect piece of hardware for a huge majority of, of everyone. It seems like this will be the catalyst according to everything we've heard. So yeah, it wouldn't be surprising at all. Yeah, it's it's close enough in power to the 865 that as as, as uh, Simon pointed out, most people aren't gonna notice. 
Uh, Motorola. I mean, Razor we don't know is... this now, anyway. You, you, right. You really notice when you see the benchmarks, and you can parade your numbers in front of your friends. But really, that's uh, any phone that is a couple of years old. Most people don't notice the difference when they change. Uh, Roger, you just bought a new phone, and you went from a flagship phone that was a few years old to to a mid range phone. Uh, you ended up getting the what? The Pixel Three A. Yeah, I got a Pixel 3a, and I bought it, one, because uh, Samsung basically stopped supporting supporting my Samsung Galaxy S6. Uh, and two, the Pixel 3 is a great value. Granted, I bought it on, on, on a Black Friday sale, but typically it sells for $399. Black Friday, I got it for $299, so I saved 100 bucks off of it. It's 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 moderately faster than my uh, Galaxy S6. Has a much better camera for uh, for low light shooting, um, and it has the latest uh, um, Android OS on it. So, all in all, I needed an upgrade, and that was a good fit. And I only really do a certain amount of of tasks on it that don't require a huge amount of CPU uh, cycles uh, to to crunch through. I'm telling you, folks, 2020 could be, you know, the cresting of the popularity of the mid-range phone. We've seen it building uh, for years. Maybe this is its year. The ultimate commodi commodi commoditization. <laughs> I can say it. Easy for you to say. I liked the way you did it. It was kind of like, you know, you're a DJ. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> lots of 5G stories always in our subreddit, as well as lots of other tech stories that are really, really interesting. You should participate. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can also join in on the conversation in real time in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. What's in the mailbag today, Sarah? Oh, Chance the Hacker, our oh. friend Chance, says, in regards to focus mode, that was our story yesterday uh, that Google had rolled out to help us all focus better. Chance says, to me, this feels a lot like one of those things I think I really need, but once I get it, I'll never actually become useful. On my Pixel, I currently use Google's wind down mode. I love the blue light filter, uh, but then I also have a grayscale mode that I set up to turn on at my bedtime. Every night at bedtime, it flips on, I get annoyed, and then I turn it off. This has gone on for over a year. It's been on since I bought my Pixel 3 last year. I'm still shutting it off every night. I'm looking forward to setting up my focus mode so I can start shutting it off each day as well. <laughs> he also sent us a picture of Lulu the cat wrapped in a blanket. Thank Aww. you, Chance. It might just be me that appreciates these cat photos, everybody, but they are still appreciated. Uh, and then John, uh, regarding uh, our conversation from a couple of days ago, said, I'm hunting for a browser plugin that when I go to a website I specify will throw me a message that I specify. For example, just give me a reminder that this link is from The Onion, a reminder that this is Politico, so I should check the author, that type of thing. I don't need it to be curated by anybody else, but I don't trust me after a few drinks or a long day at work to double check every source 100% of the time. Of course, he's responding to our discussion of how to know whether you can trust a source and the fact that we all said every once in a while, every one of us has been at least momentarily fooled by a satirical article, possibly from The Onion. So John is like, give me, a, give me an extension that I can say, remind me anytime... I'm looking at a link from one of the following sources. I think that's that's pretty clever. <laughs> it is the season. Holiday parties. Let's get this uh, extension going. But yeah, I think uh, I've uh, especially we've all been there where you're like tired and you kind of go, OK, this story looks legit. Oh, wait, it's from four months ago. Gosh, darn it. So, yes, uh, that would be helpful as well when it's like date outdated, <laughs> outdated article. Shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including James P. Callison, Juan D. Hernandez and Jonathan Price. Also, thanks Ooh. to Patrick Beja, who's here on a Thursday rather than Tuesday. It's it's upside down world, uh, but it was fun nonetheless. Patrick, what's been going on with you? Uh, well, I guess uh, I should tip my hat to Raise the Dead by our good friend Jury. So go check that out if you haven't already. And otherwise, uh, check out Pixels, my gaming show. It's gaming season. It's the end of the year. All the best games are out and waiting for you. So Pixels is the show you want to listen if you're interested in that. And if you're interested in uh, reasonable polit political discussions, uh, go check out The Phileas Club. That is a show that you might enjoy. Those are both available at frenchspin.com. 
We have new Patreon exclusive merch to celebrate six years of DTNS. Len Peralta created a six year anniversary version of the DTNS logo. And if you back certain levels at patreon.com slash DTNS for three months, you'll get either a sticker, a poster, a mug, or a t shirt, depending on the level. Get the details at patreon.com slash DTNS slash merch. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Keep them coming. Love you, Mills. We're also live. If you can join us live, please do. That's Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. My gosh, I forgot it was Pacific time. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with David Spark and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. Bye. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>